Hello, my name is Tom Sinclair. I'm a volunteer with Extinction Rebellion. What I'm going to do in this screencast is present you with the facts that inspired me to join. When people talk about the environment, as I'm going to do, they often focus on the beauty and wonder of one or another part of it, in the hope that people will be inspired to protect it. And that can be very powerful. But it also brings with it the risk that we never really face up to the reality of the situation that we're in. Instead, we create a false sense of security. So I'm not going to do that here. I'm going to be guided by the core Extinction Rebellion principle of telling the truth and acting as if the truth is real. This might not make for easy listening. You might find yourself feeling despair or fear or anger. But I think those feelings are appropriate and rational. So I urge you not to turn away from them or from this video, but to allow yourself to feel them and to stay with me through to the end. I'm going to start by talking about climate change. Almost everything I say is going to be based on these reports by the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, the IPCC. IPCC reports are the results of many, many years of work by hundreds of scientists from across the globe, reviewing all the relevant scientific research on climate change and its impacts, hundreds and hundreds of scientific articles in international peer-reviewed journals. To make predictions about the climate, they draw on physics and geological evidence, and they look at the results from lots of climate models, mathematical simulations of the climate and all the factors that affect it and how it develops. So they don't rely on just one study, or just one scientific paper, or just one theoretical model of the climate. The conclusions of these reports aren't just the views of a few outliers or crackpots. They represent an international mainstream consensus that even very cautious, reticent members of the scientific community are prepared to stand behind. Let me start with a quick explanation of global warming and the greenhouse effect. When we talk about global warming, we're talking in particular about the way in which increasing amounts of certain gases in the Earth's atmosphere, notably carbon dioxide but also some others, changes the climate on Earth. They change how hot the Earth is on average, what kind of large-scale weather patterns we see, which parts of the world are wet and which dry, and so on. Having more greenhouse gases in the atmosphere tends to make the Earth hotter on average because the gases trap heat reflected from the Earth's surface that would otherwise go back into space. Without any greenhouse gases in the atmosphere, the Earth would be very much colder than it is now. But with more greenhouse gases in the atmosphere, you would expect the Earth to be hotter than it is now. And that's just how things have gone in the Earth's history. You can see from this graph how global temperatures have tracked global atmospheric carbon dioxide levels over the past 800,000 years. There's a close correlation between the two. When the carbon dioxide goes up, so does the temperature. And when the carbon dioxide goes down, so does the temperature. Now, in the past 200 years, since the Industrial Revolution, humans have been burning huge amounts of coal, oil and gas to generate power. This emits carbon dioxide. The human civilizations we know evolved in conditions of about 280 parts per million of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere. But in the last 200 years, levels of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere have risen to over 400 parts per million. In fact, they're now higher than they've been in the last 3 million years, since before humans existed. As you'd expect, over the same period, since the Industrial Revolution, the Earth has started to get hotter. The increased carbon dioxide in the atmosphere is trapping more of the heat that would otherwise have been reflected back into space, and that's increasing the temperature. Global surface temperatures are already at around 1 degree centigrade on average, above pre-industrial levels. Here's another way of representing the same data, which brings out the heating trend even more clearly. As you can see, there have been some exceptional years at other points over the past 170 years, but there's a very clear, strong heating trend that's picked up over the past 20. So that's the basic science of global warming and the greenhouse effect. Back to the IPCC now. Governments have, of course, been worried about climate change. Recently, they asked the IPCC to tell us how bad the impacts of global warming of 1.5 degrees would be, and also to tell us how much worse global warming of 2 degrees would be. The IPCC gave its answer in 2018. Its conclusions were stark. It told us that the impacts can be expected to be much worse at 2 degrees, and therefore that we must keep to 1.5 degrees. But it also said that 1.5 degrees is far from safe. Just at 1.5 degrees, hundreds of millions more people than now will be exposed to risks of water scarcity, flooding, drought, wildfires, 
deadly heat waves, rising sea levels and storms. Key coastal ecosystems, marine species and fisheries will be lost. We will see heat-related ozone and undernutrition deaths. At two degrees, the risks are greatly increased and further hundreds of millions of people are exposed to them. We can also expect complete and irreversible destruction of key ecosystems and species and widespread food insecurity. The IPCC illustrates all this with a picture of major political destabilization across the globe and a sharp increase in species extinctions. The publishers and authors of this report were not relaxed about these conclusions. Eric Solheim, the executive director of the UN's Environment Programme, said, It's like a deafening, piercing smoke alarm going off in the kitchen. We have to put out the fire. Deborah Roberts, the co chair of the IPCC Impacts Group, said, It's a line in the sand. And what it says to our species is that this is the moment and we must act now. The next few years are probably the most important in our history. So what do we need to do to avert these terrible consequences? This graph shows how our carbon dioxide emissions have to change from now on if we're to limit global warming to 1.5 degrees, according to the IPCC. It says we have to cut them drastically, starting right now, reducing them by nearly half in the next 10 years, and then on to zero by 2050 at the latest. We're also going to have to suck a huge amount of carbon out of the air. We won't have to do as much of this if we cut our resource and energy consumption quickly now, but we'll still have to do some. But actually, this might be understating how bad things are. IPCC reports are very rigorous, as I said. But many of the models it uses assume that we will have carbon capture and storage technologies that so far have never been shown to work at the necessary scale. It's that technology that's supposed to suck all the extra carbon out of the atmosphere. Some of the models also assume that we will be growing bioenergy crops on an area twice the size of India. Moreover, the IPCC assumes that a policy limits us to 1.5 degrees of warming if most of the models it looks at give us a 1 in 2 to 2 in 3 chance of remaining under that limit. But even at best, that still leaves a 1 in 3 chance that the policy won't limit warming to 1.5 degrees. And in fact, if we leave net zero until 2050, the IPCC says that that gives us only a 50-50 chance of staying below 1.5. So aiming at the 2050 target leaves us exposed to big risks, according to the IPCC itself. Finally, the way that the climate develops turns out to involve dynamics called climate feedback loops and tipping points that can make global warming much more devastating. And the IPCC's models don't factor all of these in. Here's an example of that last point, a feedback loop based on something called the albedo effect. We all understand the albedo effect. It's why we wear light-coloured clothes on hot days. They reflect heat rather than absorbing it. Something similar goes on with sea ice in the Arctic. It reflects heat back into space. But as the atmosphere heats up, this melts the sea ice, and that replaces the light-coloured reflective surface of the ice with the darker surface of the sea, which absorbs heat rather than reflecting it. That increases the temperature, and as a result, more ice melts, which of course increases the dark surface that's absorbing heat, and so on. There are other possible feedback loops like this. Each feedback loop involves a process that changes the climate or the environment in a way that contributes to the process itself, a kind of snowball effect. Now, some of these feedback loops involve tipping points. Once we pass the tipping point in some climate process, there's no stopping it. It's going to go all the way to its end point, whatever we do. It's like passing the point of no return as you get near a waterfall in your boat. This image shows you some of the tipping points that scientists have identified. For example, one tipping point relates to the Amazon rainforest. If the Amazon dries out beyond a certain point, the rainforest ecosystem won't be able to sustain itself and it will switch to a savanna ecosystem instead. The Amazon is a massive carbon storage bank at the moment, but if it passes this tipping point, it will begin to release all that carbon into the atmosphere, exacerbating global warming. So once we're past a certain point, almost all that carbon is going to be released, and all the temperature increases that it causes will be locked in. As you can see, there are lots of possible tipping points. The IPCC discusses some of these. It says that even at temperature increases under 2 degrees, there is in fact a risk of passing some tipping points that make climate change much more dangerous than predicted. The risk gets bigger with every fraction of a degree of warming. But other tipping points it sets aside, because it's just too uncertain how and by what temperature increases they'll be triggered. There just hasn't been enough research yet for the IPCC to be able to make an informed estimate. 
But it certainly happened before that after the IPCC has issued a report, their predictions have turned out to be too optimistic because of the effects of feedback loops and tipping points. Already it looks like we may be too late to stop the West Antarctic ice sheet collapsing, for instance, and once it does collapse, that will lock in several metres of sea level rise. In some scenarios then, not all of which we fully understand, the temperature increases we've caused push climate processes past their tipping points, and that pushes other processes past their own tipping points, which triggers other tipping points, and so on. This gives rise to the possibility of a tipping cascade, and with it, unstoppable global warming and other disasters like the loss of the Amazon rainforest. There may come a point where devastating changes to our world get locked in by processes that have escaped our control. As I said, the IPCC says we need to cut greenhouse gas emissions almost in half by 2030 and then to zero by 2050 at the latest if we want to stay below 1.5 degrees of warming. It says that this is going to require a radical transformation of energy, industry, transport, building, agriculture, forestry and land use. But if you took away from the IPCC report the lesson that everything will be fine just so long as we stick to those emissions limits, you'd be making a big mistake. For one thing, you'd be forgetting just how bad the effects of 1.5 degrees are. 1.5 degrees is a terrible result. For another, you'd be ignoring the fact that the 2050 target relies on technologies we haven't got yet. For a third, you'd be ignoring the fact that sticking to those emissions limits still leaves us exposed to big risks of temperature rises over 1.5 degrees. And for a fourth, you'd be ignoring all the extra risks represented by climate feedback loops and tipping points. Once we take into account all these factors, it's clear that we need to be doing something even more demanding, cutting emissions much faster, transforming energy, industry, transport and the rest much more radically, and investing much more in carbon capture technologies, for instance. But in any case, we're not sticking to the IPCC emissions limits. We're doing the opposite. Annual emissions are still going up. As I said, even a temperature rise of 1.5 degrees is disastrous putting hundreds of millions of people in danger, causing heat-related, ozone and undernutrition deaths, and killing key ecosystems and fisheries. But we're not on track even for that. In fact, we're not even on track for two degrees. The world's governments have made commitments and set targets and policies under the 2015 Paris Agreement designed to limit global warming to two degrees. But they don't add up to enough for even that disastrous target, so even sticking to them would see rises of around 2.8 degrees by the end of this century. And, as you can also see from this graph, our current path doesn't stick to those commitments and policies anyway. In fact, we're currently on track for upwards of 3 degrees by the end of the century. That's more than double that line in the sand that the IPCC drew. And if emissions keep growing at their present rate, we may be headed for much worse, more than 4 degrees. That's what the red area shows you. Even if emissions don't keep rising, there's still a significant risk of a 4 degree increase even on current policies, something like a 1 in 20 chance. A four-degree world is so far removed from the world that we know that it's extremely hard to quantify the impact, but it would certainly be catastrophic, with deadly heat waves as the new normal, permanent drought, global famine, and more. As the World Bank says, four degrees of warming simply must not be allowed to occur. But we're risking it anyway. And that's not taking into account all the other dangers of feedback loops and tipping points. So we may be even closer to catastrophe than we think. And this isn't something that can be left for future generations to deal with. For one thing, it's our emissions now that make the difference to people in the future, just as emissions in the past mean that we're stuck with the one degree temperature rises we've seen already. And atmospheric carbon dioxide sticks around for centuries, so the effects will be felt for a long time. For another, there is evidence that we're going to be hitting catastrophic temperatures sooner than we thought anyway. The graph I showed you a moment ago was based on the IPCC's projections. But more recent research suggests that the IPCC projections underestimate the speed of global warming. It found that three trends, continued rising emissions, declining air pollution and natural climate cycles, will combine over the next 20 years to make climate change faster and more furious than anticipated. We're heading towards 2 degrees just by 2050. As the authors wrote, policymakers have less time to respond than they thought. Just to make this stuff a bit more concrete, here are some examples of the sorts of impacts we're talking about. One impact is in the form of sea level rise. According to one recent analysis, two degrees of warming submerges land home to more than 250 million people globally, 
And that's not taking into account the possible collapse of the West Antarctic ice sheet. At 4 degrees, it's more than 600 million, including around 6 million people in the UK. Moreover, once floods from storm surges and the like are factored in, things are a lot worse. Another impact is in the form of drought. There will be big increases in the probability of drought in southern Europe, North Africa and the Middle East, just at 2 degrees. And even as dry areas dry out further with increased global warming, so other areas will become increasingly wet, with increases in the intensity and frequency of rainfall extremes and flooding. At the same time, we'll see more destructive extreme events, such as cyclones, typhoons and hurricanes. And of course, all this is likely to produce mass migration of people. Not only as a result of the sea level rises, droughts, extreme precipitation and cyclones themselves, but also the crop failures, famine, political instability and war that are likely to accompany them. The most widely cited estimate predicts 200 million environmental migrants by 2050, roughly the population of the fifth biggest country in the world, Brazil. And these are all at levels of global warming quite a lot lower than the ones we're actually on track for. Even the global temperature increase we've seen to date is having an impact, as this screenshot from 2018 shows. In 2008 alone, 20 million people were displaced by extreme weather events, four times as many as by conflict and violence. We're already losing land to desertification as the heating planet dries regions out. Over the last 30 years, 1.6 billion people have been affected by droughts. And scientists are now able to conclude that many of these events wouldn't have been as bad or wouldn't even have happened without human-caused global warming. The disasters we've been seeing in recent years have our fingerprints on them. And the impacts we're seeing already aren't confined to distant parts of the world either. You sometimes hear people saying that they wouldn't mind if the UK got a bit warmer. But the UK isn't going to be just the same but a bit milder. We're already getting a taste of what scientists are telling us we can really expect. More extreme weather, more droughts and more wildfires, but at the same time wetter winters, more floods, more loss of land in coastal areas. Again, scientists are now able to say confidently that many of these types of events just wouldn't have happened without the contribution of climate change. People are already losing their lives, their crops, their livelihoods, their homes and their property, as well as seasonal rhythms and wildlife and landscapes familiar for generations going back beyond memory. And we can confidently expect more loss of life and livelihoods and homes, more billions of pounds of damage, just from climate impacts directly on the UK, on our current trajectory. But of course, even if the direct impacts weren't going to be that bad, we are hugely dependent on global supply systems as well as global political stability, security and peace. Just think about our food, for instance. More than 150 different countries supply us with food, including around three quarters of our fruit and vegetables. As a result, most of the land and the huge amounts of water we depend upon for our food production are abroad. Globalised supply chains concentrate food production in so-called breadbasket regions of the world. But these regions are highly vulnerable to the climate-related disasters that will be more severe and frequent in the coming decades. Indeed, many of the most important countries for our food supply are already facing water stress themselves. So there will be no escaping the effects of catastrophic climate change. Not for us, not for anyone. The impacts we're seeing already aren't confined to other parts of the world then. But it's true that most of the already staggering cost of climate change to date has been borne by people in the global south, people of colour, women, children, people whose voices you're least likely to have heard. So let me give you an example of such a voice. These are the words of Shamizur Ghazi, an 83-year-old Bangladeshi. Climate change has wrecked everything, she says. Our people are living in other towns and cities like refugees. All I wanted was to grow old with my children and their children. But now they are gone, and I don't think they will ever return. And yet Ghazi is in some ways one of the lucky ones. Let me tell you another story about the human impact of the kinds of extreme weather that we can expect to see more of over the coming decades. This is the account of one survivor from Cyclone Nargis, which hit Myanmar in 2008. On the 2nd of May, Min Min Ai, her husband and their two daughters, aged three and six, took their boat to a nearby island to buy wood. The family lived from selling the timber in Bogale and other towns. The family planned to sleep in the boat. They saw nothing unusual in the wind, which gathered steadily through the afternoon. But by 9pm it had reached a force so frightening that they abandoned the small craft for shore and hurried into the first house they could find. Some 25 others were already cowering there. As the cyclone approached, 
It drove massive waves up the vast tidal rivers that drained from the Irwardy Delta into the Indian Ocean. The floodwaters surged over the island where Mien Mien Ai's family were marooned, tearing the house from its stilt legs and driving its collapsing structure into a nearby haystack. I couldn't see anything, she said. All I know is that people were grabbing the haystack and trying to hold on to each other as the water pulled at us. My husband and I held hands and we each held one of the children. Cast into the water, the couple grabbed the branches of a tree, only to be swallowed up by the drifting haystack. Mint Mint I lost her husband's hand forever. Minutes later, she says the realization crept over her that life was also slipping from her three year old daughter, who was still in her grasp. Stricken by grief, she gave herself up to the current, preferring to hold the tiny body of her daughter rather than try to save herself. Although I knew that my little daughter was dead, she said, I told myself I would never let her go. The wind and the water had been too much for her and she became as limp as a piece of cloth. Mien Mien Ai says she slipped in and out of consciousness until fortune saw her washed up on another island. Bits of wood were piling up on top of me and I was stuck beneath them. I struggled to get out and realised I had let go of my child. I tried to grab her again, but I could only find her leg. Then another wave hit us, and because her body was so slippery, I lost her. All this is enough to show that we face an emergency of unprecedented proportions. But it gets worse. You can understand a bit more about why by thinking about all the ways in which we're dependent on the natural world. Let me introduce two important ideas, ecosystems and biodiversity. An ecosystem is a community of living things interacting with their non-living environment as a distinct system linked by nutrient and energy flows. Biodiversity is a measure of the variety of life at genetic, species and ecosystem levels. We are massively dependent on ecosystems and biodiversity. To give a couple of examples, wetlands, rainforests and rivers purify and distribute water. Soil health, marine health and pollinators are essential for food production. Biodiversity is a key source of new medicines. More generally, we depend on ecosystems and biodiversity for food and fresh water for wood and materials, for fuel, flood regulation and disease regulation. And not only that, it turns out that we also depend on these things to mitigate climate change. For example, many ecosystems operate as vast carbon storage banks, regulating atmospheric carbon dioxide and producing oxygen. Some of the feedback loops I mentioned arise because accelerating global warming undermines their capacity to do that, which accelerates the warming still further. And yet we are destroying ecosystems and reducing biodiversity at a rate unprecedented in human history. The key causes of destruction are pesticide and fertilizer use, land conversion, monoculture, pollution, deforestation, water use, biological invasion and disease, tourism, mining and war. Here's an example. What this graph shows is that populations of monitored vertebrates have dropped by 60% on average since 1970. To put that in perspective, if we did this to human populations, that would be the equivalent of emptying North America, South America, Africa, Europe, China and Oceania. That is the scale of what we have done. And again, this isn't just abroad. The same trends are present in the UK, with a 60% decline in the abundance of priority species, including hedgehogs and hares, and declines of 50% in farmland birds, such as the skylark and lapwings, and woodland butterflies, such as meadow browns and common blues. And this is just since 1970. By 1970, of course, the UK's wildlife had already been depleted by centuries of hunting, pollution, habitat loss, and degradation. And there's much more. Humans have converted more than half of the Earth's land cover from forest and grassland to crops, cities and grazing. Global forest area has shrunk by 40%. Forests have virtually disappeared altogether in 25 countries. A recent report found that an area of forest bigger than the UK is being lost every year. Almost 90% of the Earth's wetlands have gone. Half of the Earth's coral cover has been lost since the 1870s. Humans have altered the oceans through fishing, pollution and aquaculture and development. Two-thirds of the Earth's ocean area is affected. Phytoplankton populations, which are the foundation of the ocean food chain and produce more oxygen than all the Earth's trees combined, are down by 40% since 1950. Insect populations are in freefall. Recent studies in the UK, Denmark and Germany record declines in insect numbers of up to 80% just in a few decades, threatening what researchers call a catastrophic collapse of nature's ecosystems. 
The sheer mass of wild animals is down by more than 80%. It will take five to seven million years for mammal diversity to recover. This brings me to the question of extinction. Species are going extinct all the time. There's something called the background rate of extinction. And normally this is compensated for by speciation, the development of new species. But during what's called a mass extinction event, the extinction rate spikes without a corresponding increase in the speciation rate. You can see on the slide how expected extinctions compare with observed extinctions since 1900 for a sample range of animals. The current extinction rate is estimated to be between 100 and 10,000 times the normal background rate, and there's no corresponding increase in the speciation rate. This isn't really a surprise. There have been five mass extinctions in the Earth's history, including the one that wiped out the dinosaurs. Common features of the big five extinctions include unusual climate dynamics, for example, rapid changes in temperature or large-scale weather patterns, changes in atmospheric composition, for example, increased carbon dioxide or decreased oxygen, and abnormally high-intensity ecological stressors, for example, habitat loss or disease. All of these features are present now. Temperatures and sea levels are rising rapidly. Greenhouse gas concentrations in the atmosphere are rising much more rapidly than in the past 65 million years, and the gases are already at levels unseen in the past 3 million years, as we saw earlier. For context, humans in modern form have been on Earth for only about 200,000 years. Civilization as we know it is only about 6,000 years old. Land untouched by humans has been slashed by about half in just a few hundred years. The amount of plastic waste we're generating is rising drastically, with more and more ending up in the oceans, even on conservative estimates. That's what the line marked low on the second graph here shows. And in less than a century, we have gone from a situation in which most fisheries were undeveloped to one in which almost a quarter have collapsed. The unavoidable conclusion is that the Earth's sixth mass extinction has already arrived, and we are causing it. This is about loss of species and populations, of biodiversity and ecosystems, but it is also about loss of abundance, of sheer numbers. This can be hard to see, because our baselines shift over time, and each generation thinks the natural world it sees is the normal one. So it might help to make what's going on a bit more vivid if I quote you a passage from the Michael McCarthy book, The Moth Snowstorm. In the book, McCarthy describes his first encounter with a buddleia as a child in England in the 1950s. The plant, an ordinary suburban buddleia, like this one here, like the buddleias we've all seen, was, he says, absolutely teeming, crawling with butterflies. And this abundance was part of its fascination for him, a fascination that gave rise to a lifelong love of the natural world. Writing of his childhood, he says, This is not childhood seen through rose-tinted binoculars. I remember it clearly. It was somehow at the heart of the attraction. I don't think I could have been affected in the same way by a solitary red admiral. Marvel of creation, though it is. There were lots of many things then. Suburban gardens were thronged with thrushes. Hares galumphed across every pasture. Mayflies hatched on springtime rivers in dazzling swarms and larks filled the air, and poppies filled the fields, and if butterflies filled the summer days, the moths filled the summer nights. And sometimes the moths were in such numbers that they would pack a car's headlight beams like snowflakes in a blizzard. There would be a veritable snowstorm of moths, and at the end of your journey, you would have to wash your windscreen. You would have to sponge away the astounding richness of life. McCarthy was a child in the 1950s. Thirty years later, when I was a child in the 80s, we had a buddleia in our garden. I too associate it with butterflies. It would sometimes have six or seven on it at once, but it was never crawling with them. Another thirty years later, I have a buddleia in my garden now. If I even see two butterflies on it, everyone in the family comes out to look. The moth snowstorm that McCarthy describes I have never seen, nor the hares, nor the thrushes, nor any of the rest of it. It should be clear that these problems of climate change and ecosystem collapse and extinction they're not independent of one another. Climate change and biodiversity loss and ecosystem collapse are mutually reinforcing. In a way, they represent a kind of giant feedback loop. And remember, global annual emissions and rates of biodiversity and ecosystem loss are currently both rising. As we saw, we are on track for three degrees of global warming with a significant risk of more. That would be terrible enough on its own. 
But we must also take into account a range of possible feedback loops and tipping points, and the scale and speed at which we're currently destroying ecosystems and biodiversity. So the picture is much worse once these things are factored in. Let me remind you again of the 2018 IPCC report. Even a 1.5 degree rise in temperatures is a disaster. Hundreds of millions more people exposed to water scarcity, flooding, severe drought, wildfires, deadly heat waves, rising sea levels and storms, high risk of loss of key ecosystems, marine species and fisheries, heat-related ozone and undernutrition deaths. And don't forget the political instability and migration crises that are likely to accompany all of this. And again, we hear statistics like these all the time, but we don't always face up to what they mean. We are talking about migration crises many times more severe and lasting than the Syrian migrant crisis of 2015, with its harrowing images of island Kurdi. We are talking about war and famine. We are talking about people queuing for days for a loaf of bread, of parents going without so their children can live, and of other children just sitting around waiting for death. This is what we are talking about when we talk about the climate and ecosystem crisis. Even at 1.5 degrees, this is what we are talking about. At 4 degrees and beyond, we are talking about the collapse of civilization. Remember, current policies give us about a 5% chance of 4 degrees or more. That's 1 in 20. As one climate researcher asked, how many of us would choose to buckle our grandchildren into an airplane seat if we knew that there was as much as a 1 in 20 chance of the planes crashing? With climate change that can pose existential threats, we have already put them on that plane. That's your children, my children, children who are not responsible for what we have done and are doing and who have no power to stop it. It may take time for all this to sink in. The challenge is not to know all the facts. We've all heard many of these facts before, but we don't think about them once we turn back to our everyday lives. The challenge is really to see the facts and to be moved by them. The response of turning away, of trying not to think about it, is no longer appropriate. Please allow yourself to feel the enormity of this, the grief and the despair, as you pause the video for a minute before continuing. So what is the right reaction to the situation that we're in? It is clear that we must act now. The IPCC says we need radical transformations in every domain if we want to reach net zero emissions by 2050. But once we factor in the risks of tipping points and current rates of ecosystem destruction and biodiversity loss, the fact that the 2050 target gives us only a 50-50 chance of sticking under the 1.5 degree limit, the fact that every single fraction of a degree counts in any case, and the recognition that many of the IPCC models rely on technology we don't have yet, and the use of land twice the size of India for bioenergy crops, we need to start thinking even more radically. We need to reduce carbon emissions to zero much faster. We need immediate deep cuts in energy demand. We need massive investment in negative emissions technologies. We can't afford to use up the fossil fuels we've discovered, let alone search for more. We need to overhaul transport and agriculture. And we need to restore damaged ecosystems and halt further destruction. You might ask, but aren't governments already doing what's necessary? The answer is no. Remember this graph which shows our ever-increasing annual fossil fuel emissions. And remember all the evidence of ecosystem destruction and biodiversity loss. Yet we have had a very long time to make changes that would have been much less radical and difficult if we'd made them sooner. Whole generations have chosen not to do anything about the looming climate and ecological catastrophe, opting instead to burn ever more fossil fuels and destroy more ecosystems. The risks of climate change and ecosystem collapse have been known about for a long time. Exxon were aware of the likelihood and risks of global warming in the 1970s. Climate scientists testified before US Congress in the 1980s. In 1990, the UN Advisory Group on Greenhouse Gases said that warming beyond 1 degree centigrade may elicit rapid, unpredictable and non-linear responses that could lead to extensive ecosystem damage. In 1995, the UN Environment Programme warned that the Earth's biological resources were under serious threat. But more than half our total fossil fuel emissions have been emitted in the last three decades. As David Wallace Wells, author of The Uninhabitable Earth, points out, that means that we have done as much damage to the fate of the planet and its ability to sustain human life and civilization since Al Gore published his first book on climate than in all the centuries that came before. We have now engineered as much ruin knowingly as we ever managed in ignorance. What about the UK? It's true that the UK claims to be a leader on these issues. 
But let's look at its record a bit more closely. In 2013, the Prime Minister, David Cameron, was reported to say we have got to get rid of all this green crap. He went on to announce the biggest new road building scheme in decades in 2014. In 2015, the UK ended subsidies for onshore wind at the same time as expanding subsidies for oil and gas drilling worth billions of pounds. In 2016, it scrapped zero carbon homes, and just this year has proposed weakening energy efficiency standards for new homes. In 2017, it approved a new runway at Heathrow and sold off the Green Investment Bank. Since 2013, the UK has provided £2.4 billion worth of support for fossil fuel projects via UK export finance, effectively de-risking fossil fuel investments abroad. And don't be taken in by the recent announcement that the UK will stop financing coal projects abroad. It hasn't been doing that since 2002 anyway, and there's been no change in policy on fossil fuels more generally. Just a couple of weeks ago at the government-backed UK-Africa Investment Summit, more than 90% of the £2 billion worth of energy deals were for fossil fuel projects. The UK's supposedly world-leading emissions reductions since 1990 have been achieved largely as a result of declining industry and by switching from one fossil fuel, coal, to another, gas. And they don't take into account shipping, aviation and imported emissions anyway. We're still above the global average in terms of per capita emissions and, of course, in terms of our historical emissions. And the UK is not on course to meet its legally binding carbon budgets, even according to its own Committee on Climate Change. So we're not on track to meet our Paris commitments, let alone anything more ambitious. The recent net zero emissions legislation has prompted absolutely none of the radical transformation in policy necessary to achieve that target. Meanwhile, the UK will meet just five of the 20 biodiversity targets it signed up to in 2010 under the International Convention on Biodiversity. UK spending on biodiversity as a proportion of GDP has in fact fallen by 40% since 2009. And we've recently learned that the UK government is weakening pesticide regulation as part of Brexit. Extinction Rebellion's first demand, then, is that the government must tell the truth about the climate and ecological crisis that we face and act like it's real. It must declare a climate and ecological emergency, working with other institutions to communicate the scientific evidence and the urgency and scale of the need for change. As you may know, the UK Parliament did declare a climate emergency last year. But telling the truth is about more than acknowledging the emergency. It's about communicating accurately and vividly the scientific facts and the risks we face. Think about the pictures of blackened lungs on cigarette packets, or the campaigns on drink driving. The government and mass media are doing next to nothing of that sort. Extinction Rebellion's second demand is that government must act now to halt biodiversity loss and reduce greenhouse gas emissions to net zero by 2025. This is ambitious. As we've seen, the IPCC says we need net zero by 2050 at the latest to stay under 1.5 degrees, and the UK enshrined that target in law last year in response to Extinction Rebellion protests, among other things. However, the zero emissions legislation doesn't deal with aviation or shipping or imported emissions, and it uses international carbon credits to offset emissions, contrary to the UK's own Committee for Climate Change recommendations. More to the point, we know that the 2050 target gives us only a 50-50 chance of staying under 1.5 degrees, doesn't factor in ecosystem collapse, potential unexpected feedback loops, or the speed of global warming, and relies on untested technologies. A target of net zero by 2050 alone takes huge risks, the kinds of risks we wouldn't normally even contemplate, even with much less at stake. Isn't this impossible? No. It would be a World War II-style mass mobilisation, But there has been a World War II-style mass mobilisation before, in World War II. The UK's economy was transformed during World War II in order to win the war. By 1943, more than half of national expenditure was directly on the war effort. From 1939 to 1942, imports of animal feedstuffs fell by 94%, butter and sugar by almost 70%, and wheat by a third. From 1938 to 1941, annual aircraft production rose from under 3,000 to more than 20,000. So this sort of transformation is not impossible. But in our rather dysfunctional democracy, it's difficult to address the crisis through standard democratic procedures. These things that should not be party political become politicised. So Extinction Rebellion calls for a citizens' assembly on the action required to achieve the necessary transitions. Government must create such an assembly and be bound by its decisions. The Citizens' Assembly that Extinction Rebellion calls for uses a process called sortition to randomly select people to form representative assemblies, a little like the procedures used by polling companies. 
The citizens make their decisions in a fair, non-adversarial setting, informed by researchers and specialists who must disclose their funding and avoid advocating any particular policy. Members of the Citizens' Assembly would get a proportionate impression of the scientific consensus on climate change and learn about policies in detail before deciding. A Citizens' Assembly allows us to get away from party politics and short-term thinking. It also allows us to avoid lobbying and corruption and the power that carbon-heavy companies currently have. Citizens' Assemblies have proved in the past to be effective means of addressing issues that were thought to be too toxic for conventional politics. For example, they were used to decide questions relating to gay marriage and abortion in Ireland and nuclear waste in South Australia. You may know that Parliament has set up a Citizens' Assembly on climate change that is meeting this year. But its conclusions won't be binding. They'll merely be inputs and informed debate. We all know how much of a difference our input makes when big money is at stake. The current process is not good enough. Extinction Rebellion is committed to non-violence in its efforts to get these three demands accepted. Its core strategy is non-violent direct action. This strategy belongs to a proud tradition that includes Gandhi, Cory Aquino and Martin Luther King among many others. People in this tradition have stood up for what is right even at tremendous personal cost and yet without the easy emotional satisfaction of contempt for their opponents. Their non-violent resistance is now recognised as heroism. Here's an example of the way that non-violent direct action can succeed. The Freedom Riders were people who deliberately violated segregationist bus policy in the USA in the 1960s. It started with just 13 people and ended with around 400 who participated in rides all around the country. Their actions sparked extremely violent responses, which shocked the American public, eliciting sympathy and approval for the Freedom Riders. In summer 1961, slightly fewer than 400 Freedom Riders went to prison for their actions. But after less than a year, their protests brought about the enforcement of anti-segregationist law so that people could sit wherever they wanted on buses and trains. The example of the Freedom Riders shows that you don't need the whole population out on the streets to effect change. Some recent research by Erica Chenoweth and Maria Stefan suggests that non-violent uprisings involving as little as 3.5% of the population can overthrow a regime, and in fact they have a better chance of success than violent uprisings. This research focused on rebellion against oppressive, violent governments, but it shows that a non-violent movement doesn't need majority participation to bring about radical change. It might even take less than 5% of the population to reach that critical mass of principled, courageous individuals who make a difference. Even though the challenge we face is unprecedented then, and the transformation we need is radical and far-reaching, we are not helpless. Just as carbon emissions can push climate processes past tipping points in the Earth system, risking a tipping cascade, so non-violent direct action can help to push processes of social, political and economic change past their own tipping points, generating a tipping cascade of radical change that protects us from catastrophe. The current political and economic system is held in place by powerful interests and norms. But these are not invulnerable. Public concern about climate change is already at an all-time high. If we push hard enough, we can set off that cascade. The strategic non-violent direct action that Extinction Rebellion engages in is respectful. Non-violence isn't just a matter of not hitting people. It's not a matter of mere passivity. It's more than that. Opponents are treated with respect as fellow citizens with whom we want to join to bring about the changes that are needed. This is a moral choice, but it's also strategically sensible. It's harder to demonise respectful protesters, and public sympathy for them and their cause comes more easily as a result. Extinction Rebellion's non-violent direct action is nevertheless disruptive. Ordinary protests may be as large as you like, but it is too easy for the public and elites to ignore them. What is needed is disruption that stops business as usual, so that the public and decision makers are forced to take notice. Of course, this gives rise to tactical dilemmas. It's not always clear how much disruption is compatible with keeping the public on side, while being disruptive enough not to be dismissed too easily. There's no simple answer to that question. Extinction Rebellion's favoured kind of disruption is simple mass obstruction, not requiring special skills or equipment and not taking place at inaccessible sites. Extinction Rebellion protesters are committed and many of them have been arrested for their actions. And indeed, arrestability has been a core part of Extinction Rebellion's strategy. When protests involve costs for the protesters, as when they go on strike or risk arrest, it demonstrates moral seriousness and it captures the attention and sympathy of the public and decision-makers. But getting arrested isn't the only way to get involved. 
Hundreds of rebels have been arrested for acts of non-violent civil disobedience, but thousands more have been there alongside them. Non-arrestable protesters, welfare supporters, legal observers, providers of food and tents and infrastructure at protests, legal representatives for those arrested, artists, behind-the-scenes administrators and accommodation providers, to name but a few. Extinction Rebellion needs, recognises and welcomes every contribution from anyone who has something to give in the fight against the looming catastrophe. Not everyone is in a position to be able to offer themselves for arrest, and not everyone can trust that they'll get the basically respectful treatment by the police that Extinction Rebellion arrestees have so far largely experienced in the UK. Extinction Rebellion recognises that, and it recognises that arrests are just one part of a huge range of valuable contributions from rebels. But aren't there less disruptive ways to address the emergency? There are, but they aren't enough on their own to bring about the radical change that is needed. Raising awareness isn't enough. Awareness of the dangers we face has been raised for a very long time, since the 1970s as we saw. But here we are, with emissions rising, biodiversity loss accelerating, and so on. Urging consumers to change their choices is not enough. Again, we've been urged to make environmentally friendly choices for decades, but emissions and ecosystem destruction are still rising. Most people can't afford to make environmentally friendly purchases anyway, in a legal and economic system that makes it much cheaper to buy environmentally unfriendly products. The problem is the system in which people make their choices, which doesn't price in the collective costs of those choices. On the contrary, the system subsidises and incentivizes climate and ecosystem destruction, making it cheapest in the short term to do catastrophic damage in the long term. And you can't change the system by buying a bamboo toothbrush. It would suit governments and powerful corporations very well if everyone thought that you can only criticise the system if you never fly or drive or use plastic or a smartphone and you only eat organic food. But hardly anyone can live like that in this society, so it would pretty much give them a free pass to carry on risking our future. This is one of the reasons that Extinction Rebellion avoids blaming and shaming individuals for their private choices. Legal challenges aren't enough. Although we've just seen a landmark court ruling against Heathrow expansion on climate change grounds, the courts can only enforce the law that governments make, and as we've seen, those laws just don't do enough to address the crisis we face. And in any case, even successful court actions have not seen any serious commitment on the part of the UK government. Client Earth has won in court against the UK government over the inadequacy of the government's clean air strategy three times. And yet still the government's strategy lacks the specific policies, funding and legal limits necessary to address the problem of deadly air pollution. Elections, leafleting, letters to MPs, marches and other methods of ordinary electoral politics are also not enough. The UK electoral system penalises the Green Party. For example, in 2015, the Green Party had 3.6% of the total vote, but 0.002% of the seats. The winning party took 36.9% of the vote, but got more than half of the seats. Precisely because of this, Green votes look wasted, so even people who care deeply about the environment don't vote for them. Meanwhile, oil companies have spent billions just since the Paris Agreements on misleading climate-related branding and lobbying. Against that kind of money, green electoral strategy just doesn't stand a chance. All these other methods have helped, then, but they aren't enough on their own to push us past those desperately needed social tipping points. But isn't breaking the law just wrong? Not always. In fact, in the face of a crisis on the scale of the one that we face, almost every political position returns the answer that it is not wrong. Liberal, conservative, libertarian and socialist theories of political authority alike tell us that when governments do not safeguard peace or address threats to order or protect our security and our freedom or the common good, traditional institutions and ways of life or justice, when they are facilitating destruction of the natural world and failing in their duties to future generations, then they have lost their legitimacy. And climate change and ecosystem collapse do pose a grave and immediate threat to all of these values. Wherever you sit on the political spectrum, then, Extinction Rebellion's strategy of non-violent, disruptive civil disobedience is a necessary and proportionate response. And don't just take it from me. These are the words of one of the judges who oversaw the trials of rebels following their arrests in April last year. He said, This is going to be my last Extinction Rebellion trial for a little while. I think they only allow us to do so many of these before our sympathies start to overwhelm us. When I started, I was fully expecting to see the usual crowd of anarchists and communists and all the dreadful things the Daily Mail say you are. I have to say I have been totally overwhelmed by all the defendants. It is such a pleasure to deal with people so different from those I deal with in my regular life. Thank you for your courtesy. Thank you for your integrity. Thank you for your honesty. You have to succeed.
Remember, we are on track for three degrees of global warming by 2100, with a significant risk of four. Even two degrees means hundreds of millions of people facing food and water insecurity, flooding, severe drought, wildfires, deadly heat waves, rising sea levels and storms. Even two degrees means mass extinction, the irreversible destruction of ecosystems and species. Even two degrees means all the global political destabilization, migration crises and war that are likely to accompany these things. And that's not taking into account our destruction of ecosystems, biodiversity loss or a range of feedback loops and tipping points. In that context, you might think that the question is not whether breaking the law is wrong, but whether failing to resist is morally acceptable. There is also this question. Our political, legal and economic systems are blocking efforts to address the crisis. I don't myself buy in completely to every aspect of Extinction Rebellion's strategy and messaging. No mass movement can please all of its members all of the time. But Extinction Rebellion is decentralised and democratic. By joining, I help to shape its direction. And I have been inspired by the courage of others who have stood up to be counted in what is, as far as I can see, our only hope of living up to the challenge from future generations and millions of our contemporaries of averting climate and ecological disaster. I have been inspired by the arrestees, the placard waivers, the people who have used up all their annual leave to attend the rebellions, the people who have brought portable kitchens to cook for rebels, the people who trained as legal observers, painted banners, built stages, cleaned up protest sites, provided music, and all of the rest of it. I have come to think that I will not be able to look my children in the eye, knowing what I know, and say that I didn't join a non-violent, peaceful, respectful rebellion because I had a couple of doubts about some of the tactics, or felt like the protesters weren't like me. Nothing else is going to work. Polluters and fossil fuel companies who are endangering humanity are being given subsidies. Their executives are being given honours. Even as think tanks with anonymous funders smear Extinction Rebellion, the police categorise us with violent extremists, and the government seeks increased penalties so as to deter further attempts to highlight the trouble we're in. We have to resist. We have to stand together, shoulder to shoulder against these powerful interests and systems whose short-termism threatens us all. Thank you for listening.